So, we are in Jonah chapter 3 tonight, and um, as far as, as Jonah goes, you know, I think some people just kind of feel like Jonah stops with chapter 2. So, in chapter 1, you remember we've got Jonah uh, running from the Lord, and the Lord causing the storm on the sea. Uh, we see that the uh, sailors throw Jonah overboard. And then uh, the fish swallows Jonah. In chapter 2, we see that Jonah has that prayer uh, from the belly of the, the, the fish. And then following the conclusion of the prayer, we see that uh, the fish spits Jonah up on the dry land. And so, you know, as far as a lot of people go, when they think of the story of Jonah, that's all that they think of. And they think, okay, well, it's over at that point. And if it were over at that point, we'd be over in chapter 2, but um, we don't. We've got chapters 3 and we've got chapters 4. And um, chapter 3 is really kind of, a, a you, you know, the, the, the chapter where really the event happens. I mean, chapters 1 and 2 were leading up to that. And so um, before we get into chapter 3, um, anybody have any questions or comments from the last couple of chapters it's been a couple of weeks or well well yeah i guess it has been a two tuesdays since we've been in it nobody okay all right well then i'm flipping over to jonah and there i am right there all right Okay, so Jonah chapter 3, what we see is that, uh, and by the way, we've only got 10 verses tonight, so, um, you know, gonna, we'll read through it and then we'll talk about it, okay? So in Jonah chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah, uh, excuse me, my page folded there. Okay, verse 4 says, On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God, and they declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may re yet relent and with his compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they, had, what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. Okay? And so, like I said, chapter 3 is the, the, uh, the event that all of these things are going to be kind of leading up to. And so, you know, if you're thinking that, uh, you know, the book of Jonah ends with him um, there in the, uh, the belly of the, the, the fish uh, and then being spat up on the ground, well, you know, you, 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 you don't have the full story because, like I've been saying, Jonah is more than a fish story, right? Okay, now we're getting into the more than the fishy part. Okay, um... As you read through that, you know, what, what were some of your thoughts about that? It's not like a fishy story. Not at this point. He's got the fishy off him. Sounds, All right. sounds like the Ninevites said, oh, okay. We pretty, better act up or quit acting up. Pretty easy, wasn't it? Looked like it. Sounds like it. Yeah. Okay. You think this was also a message to Jonah? When you do what God tells you, you know, it goes over easier than what he thought it was going to be. Because when that, the whole point of why he didn't want to do this, he was afraid. I, I actually think that the reason why he didn't want to do it is because it was going to be this easy. But we're going to get into that when we get into chapter 4. Okay. okay? Um, 
here's, here's a couple of thoughts that, uh, that I had about this chapter, okay? Um, first of all, when you take a look at the first couple of verses, um, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Um, we've got to kind of understand that, you know, in chapter 2, we've got Jonah being up on the dry ground, right? Okay. And we really don't know how long it transpired uh, between chapters 2 and chapters 3, but I think that from the way that it's written there, there's a little bit of a time period, right? And so here is a question for you. Why didn't Jonah go right to Nineveh immediately from fish? I mean, if you stop and think about it, he could have just not even washed the fish scent off of him. And he could have gone right into Nineveh and used that as a uh, really good uh, object lesson there, right? You know, hey guys, you smell that? <laughs> you know what happened to me? <laughs> God has sent me to you. But he didn't do that. He, he, he went back home. Okay? So, so here's a question to you. Why didn't Jonah go immediately to Nineveh? I don't think he really wanted to do that. No, I don't think so either. I think that he, I don't want to say he was testing the Lord, mm -hmm. but it almost seems like it because he was given that request from the Lord, and he refused to do it. So, so your thoughts are that um, he fish sped him up on dry land. He still didn't want to go to Nineveh. He went home hoping that God had kind of said, no, don't do it. Right. Well, I think he was maybe even thinking maybe God would send he, somebody else. Send someone else. And someone else? He, he, he understood that Jonah was very reluctant to do this. Right. But you would think that after he prayed that prayer in the fish, you'd think that he'd go, right? Well, you would think that's what he told the Lord when he was praying inside the fish. Let, let's, take, let's backtrack a little bit. Let's go to chapter 2 and verse 9. And it says, But I, with the song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And so, in that fish, Jonah vowed something, right? And so, here's another question. What did Jonah vow? I mean, we, we don't know because it doesn't say, but it say, all, all we know is that Jonah made a vow to God. But if that vow was, God, I'll go to Nineveh, Jonah didn't do it. And so I think that we could kind of conclude, whatever Jonah vowed, it was not, God, I'm going to Nineveh, right? Okay? Now, I, I think that the vow was associated with that, of, God, I'm not going to do this again. God, if you send me somewhere again, I'm going to go, right? But I don't think it was necessarily that, Um but when we take a look at verse number three, um, what we see is that Jonah obeyed. So when that word of the Lord came to Jonah that second time, Jonah obeyed. Whether he wanted to or not, whether he thought it was a good idea or not, he went ahead and obeyed. And so I think that one valuable lesson that Jonah learned from all of this is you obey God. Okay, whether, whether you like it, whether you don't, whether you think it's a good idea or you don't. Um, whether, um, you know, you're not sure about the outcome or not, you need to obey God. And I think that regardless of what it was that he vowed in the fish, it had something to do with, I'm going to follow you and I'm going to obey you. Yes, sir. Didn't the Israelites have better soap than the people in Nineveh? That's the reason he washed, went home and washed up. Well, we don't, we don't even know that he washed up. We're assuming he washed up. And I think that, uh, you know, especially if Jonah was married, that, that would be a safe assumption. It's probably a safe assumption that he washed before he even got inside the house, right? I, w I, think, it would be, I think it would be a safe assumption that he, you know, if it were me, I would find the nearest whatever to try to get, um, you know, the, 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 the fish off me. But... Um, I'm not a I'm not a fish fan, so 
Okay. But, um, you know, I, I think about um, us, right? And that is that there's, there are times that we have stubborn streaks, just like, just like Jonah, if you want to be honest about it. And there are times that when we have stubborn streaks like Jonah, the Lord brings discipline to cure us of our stubbornness. Right? Okay. And Jonah's unwillingness to go to Nineveh um, was not the main problem. The main problem is that he didn't want to obey the Lord. Okay? You know, if, if he would have just simply vowed, okay, God, I'm going to go to Nineveh, but he didn't take care of the other problem of stubbornness, then if the Lord said, okay, now I want you to go to Babylon, or now I want you to go to Egypt, or now I want you to go, well, no, Lord, I don't want to go there. You know, I, 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 I don't want to go to the, uh, to the Armenians. I don't want to go to Damascus. You know, I'll go, I'll go to Assyria and I'll go to Nineveh because you want me to, but I'm not going to. Okay. So whatever, you know, the Lord did to Jonah in the belly of the whale, it, it cured him of that main um, problem of stubbornness. And so the vow that, that Jonah vowed, whatever it was, it had to do with that stubbornness of, I'm going to do what you want me to do. You know, whether it is, I'm not going to make the same mistake twice, or um, in the future, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do what it, whatever it was, it, it, it probably had something to do with that regard. Okay? And so kind of getting get back, hold on just a second, getting back to our stubbornness, you know, we need to understand with the Lord's discipline, it's not just simply, okay, now I'm going to do this. What we really need to concentrate on is now, Lord, I'm going to do whatever. Yes, sir. How many years was it that uh, the people of Nineveh were arch enemies with the Israelites? I don't really know. Um, it's, you know just, uh, yeah, I mean, looking at our, our timeline here, um, you know, we have, uh, let's see, um, we said that um, Jonah was right here in uh, Jeroboam II's reign. And so it was going to be something like, uh, you know, 800 and um, say, well, I guess that's 850 right there. So, you know, however... Whatever the date is, you know, we've got, you know, 8, 30, 8, 15, somewhere around in there. Okay? Because we don't know where Jonah falls. It was just in Jeroboam II. So in 722 B.C., this is where Assyria came in and destroyed the Israelites. Assyria was not necessarily the arch enemy of the Israelites. It was Syria or the Armenians that were. But when the Assyrians came and started to conquer everybody, um, they conquered Israel and then, uh, you know, they, they demanded uh, tribute from them. And then when, when Israel started to rebel against them, that's when they came in and just completely destroyed them. And so, um, you know, that, that process started at some point after um, after Daniel, I don't know, or, or uh, Jonah, I don't know the particular dates involved in that. But anyway, that, that kind of gives you an idea about the time frame that we're talking about. Anybody else have any questions? No? Okay, well that was one thing that, that I thought was, you know, at least interesting to me. Another thing that I thought was kind of interesting is what happened when um, uh, Jonah got there, okay? What we see is that in verse number three, it says, it said, Jonah obeyed the word when it came to him the second time. And so uh, he went to Nineveh. And it says, now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. Um, when you look at other translations, it would say that Nineveh was a very great city and that uh, um, it was a three-day trip or a three-day journey. And so, um, you know, the, the, the city we, we understand from chapter 4 is that there was 120,000 inhabitants there. Now, 
uh, archaeologists have excavated Nineveh. Uh, it's actually, if you remember the, uh, the Iraq war um, from years gone by, Nineveh is actually on the other side of the Tigris River from Mosul. And so if you remember the Iraqi city Mosul, in all the news reports, you know, it was on the other side of the, the uh, um, uh, Tigris River. And so, you know, it's, it's very well excavated. And um, some of the, the things that they found there in Nineveh, I mean, it's, it's astounding, uh, you know, as far as the, the size of the palace and the, the thickness of the walls. And uh, the, uh, there's uh, sculptures all over. I think there was 80 rooms in this palace. And uh, some of the, the sculptures uh, were like, um, you know, bulls with, with people's heads on top. And I mean, they were gigantic, you know. And uh, so, I mean, you know, it was a very, you know, great place. Um, but from the, the time that around Jonah would have gone to Nineveh, it was only probably about eight miles across. And so, you know, if you're thinking about a, a three-day journey as far as to go through the city, um, it, it, you know, how is that going to work? Because, uh, you know, it, it's not going to require you to walk three days to go around it. I mean, you know, um, we can ask our, our math major over there, you know, what a, a, a circumference. If you got a diameter of, of eight miles, what's the circumference? More than eight miles, I guess it's going to be, well, anyway, more than eight miles. But it's not going to take you three days to go completely around it. You know, we got, okay, Paul, you like to walk a lot. I mean, if it were me, how far I could walk in a day, it's, I'm going to be limited because I'm, I'm out of shape. <laughs> but, you know, how far do you think that you could walk in a day? Now, we're, we're talking, you know, about, you know, rough terrain and everything. Yeah, I mean, not, not mountains or anything, but not, uh, you know, not, not concrete walkways. You think maybe 20 miles a day? Well, I, you know, I'm kind of guessing that, you know, people back then probably could walk about 20 miles in a day. Okay, so, you know, three days, you're, you're talking about 60 miles. Okay, so, so Nineveh is not, the circumference around Nineveh was not 60 miles. So I don't think that's what, what this had to do with Jonah, um, you know, as far as what it meant. No, I'm not saying it's a perfect circle, but I'm just saying that, you know, the perimeter of it. Um, I'm saying that it would have either one, two things in my mind um, of what this means. Either number one is that to go through Nineveh like Jonah needed to go through Nineveh was going to require three days. And that's kind of the direction that the NIV takes here. Of a visit requires three days. Or there were other cities around Nineveh. Um, you go back to Genesis chapter 10 and you find out that uh, Nimrod was the founder of uh, Nineveh as well as several other cities. And so, uh, you know, it could be that it's not just simply Nineveh, but it's also some of these other cities. And when you draw a circumference around them, you know, or a perimeter around there, it's about 60 miles. And so either, you know, what this is talking about is that Jonah was going to go through this whole area uh, in three days making this proclamation or he was going to take his time in the city making this proclamation but he didn't have to because what we see is that it says in verse 4 on the first day Jonah started into the city and he proclaimed 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned or overthrown and, and they responded to it Okay, and so he didn't even have to do the entire time and by the way, what do you think about Jonah's message there? Pretty simple, right? It was very simple, and, and I thought he was, was not... They had different gods that they prayed to. They did. And then all of a sudden they hear Jonah say this, and they're like, oh, well then we're, we're going to obey. Yes. So then maybe he won't punish us. Yes. I think a lesson we can learn from Jonah is that we don't run from God so we can avoid a necessary hardship. Yes, that is a lesson, a lesson that we learn from Jonah. But here's another lesson. 
is that when God has things all prepared, then it really doesn't take a whole lot from us. All we have to do is be willing to be obedient. Okay? Because when I look at this, what Jonah preached here, he doesn't even say repent, does he? He doesn't even say please. He doesn't even say, I beg you to, or I want you to, or would you... He just says, 40 more days and God's going to overthrow this place. That's it. There ain't no turning back from this. There's no alternative. You know, what Jonah is saying here to the Ninevites, he's not giving them alternatives. He's just saying, God's going to do this, and that's it. And I think that Jonah is just going through the city, and he is just saying that. 40 more days, and God is going to overthrow this city. You know, and that's it. Um, but, you know, what we see is that um, just right there as soon as it happens, evidently God had been working and God had been preparing the people of Nineveh to respond to that message to where it was just simply like, uh, you know, a, a, a match in dry grass. I mean, it was just, you know, it would take off. All Jonah had to do is just say the word and that was it. Now, it could be that somehow they understood that Jonah had gone through what he went through in the whale or the big fish, you know. But then again, maybe they didn't. I don't know. But um, what happens is that they, they respond. Uh, what happens is it says in verse number five, it says um, the, uh, they uh, declared fast. It says in verse number five, I'm sorry, the Ninevites believe God. They declared a fast, and uh, all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. So sackcloth would have been, uh, you know, a black, um, um, very uh, um, loose-knit fabric. We could see through it, and, you know, that was a sign of mourning. And so they were putting on this sackcloth, mourning to say, we're mourning of our, our sins before God. Please don't destroy us. Uh, please, uh, you know, keep it safe. And um, this uh, uh, um, uh, fast, if we look on down from verse 5 to 9, you can kind of see what happens here. As a matter of fact, verse number 5 is more of the initial response, and then verses 6 through 9 is kind of what happened. Um, it says in verse number 6, When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with uh, sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. And so, you know, people are hearing Jonah and people are, are responding to Jonah. And as enough people are doing this, then the news reaches the king. And so when the news reaches the king, what he does is he believes God. He goes and he takes off his royal robes and he puts on sackcloth, which you stop and think about is, a, a, you know, a sign of humility of I am recognizing God. Okay. And then what he also does is he goes on and then has this decree. And he says, by the uh, decree of the king uh, and his nobles. And so it's not just simply the king, it's, it's those around him. It says, don't let any man or, or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let everyone be uh, cover, every beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Um, so, you know, here's the idea of we need to fast and we need to um, um, uh, cover ourselves in sackcloth in order to show our humility. Um, that repentance that they had was not just simply an outward repentance. It was an inward repentance from their wicked ways. But they were wanting to really show God that they were serious about it. Uh, so we continue on down. It says, let them give up their evil ways and their violence. And so uh, Nineveh was probably a very violent place and a very wicked place. And I think that um, as the, the wickedness and the violence increased, you know, I think that their consciences started to bother them. They might have started to think, hey, we may be in divine judgment from everything that's going on. And so it, it you know, that, that message that was there just really sparked a nerve. What do you think about this idea about uh, even covering the beasts? in sackcloth and even you know not giving any of the animals anything to eat or drink it shows that they were devoted to what the lord wanted and it also shows that they were desperate yeah 
I mean, they, they were scared. They were really thinking this is going to happen in 40 days. We have got to show God that, um, we, you know, we, we're, we're sorry for all of this. Because in verse number 9, you notice he says, Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And so here they are appealing to uh, God's grace, and here they are appealing to God's mercy. Now, how much different is this than you and I today? I mean, there are some differences, aren't there? But there's also some similarities. What about differences? Let's take somebody being saved today. Okay. What is different from what they did to what um, we do today? Do you put on sackcloth? No. Okay. Do you fast? No. Okay. Now, I mean, if somebody is saved and they do put on sackcloth and sit in the dust and, and go on a fast, I mean, I'm not going to say that they're wrong, obviously. Um, so maybe there's some differences as far as that goes. But what about some similarities? Do you see some similarities between what they were doing then and what people do today? We either they're, they're saved or they, um, you know, are, are, are being saved or they are saved and they are, you know, they've been walking away from the Lord. I think both of them are away from their evil ways, turning away from their sins. Okay. You know, that, that is part of it right there. Um, is that all that salvation is, though? Is that, well, I'm doing this same thing wrong and I'm, gonna, I'm going to, you know, stop doing it. There's more to it than that, isn't there? As a matter of fact, you are saved by grace through faith, right? And so what did these people do? The very first thing. If you go back into verse 5, um, it says, um, the people, Ninevites believed God. And so there's the thing right there. I mean, they, they had faith in God. Okay? Now, something else, and that is that another big similarity is that look at what they are believing God and look at what they are turning to. You know, there in verse number 9, he says, who knows, God may yet relent and with his compassion turn from what he intended to do. So God intended to destroy Nineveh because of their wickedness, but because they believed, because they repented, and because they were turning, then that is unleashing God's compassion. Okay? So that's another similarity that we have as far as, you know, for people being saved. When they believe that, um, you know, God is who he is and that he sent Jesus to the earth and that um, we can have salvation through him. So when we believe that and we turn away from sin, we turn to God. And we also understand that by turning to God, we have the compassion, we have the grace uh, so that God will relent from the destruction that he has for us. I mean, you know. So you can see the uh, very similarities, right? Okay. Um, now, this is something that I thought was kind of interesting here. And that is that when you take a look at, um, well, when you take a look at chapter 3 and verse number 1, what do you see there? came to Jonah. Okay. You see that, don't you? Okay. Notice that, um, you know, as far as the translation goes, any English translation, well, I won't say any English translation, many English translations will use capital O and then the lowercase O-R-D. Okay. Um, do you know what this is? Can anybody tell me what this is? Yes. God's covenant name Uh, for who? Who did he make a covenant with? He did, but it's for Israel. Because when Moses, uh, God appeared to Moses, and Moses says, who are you? 
God said, I am. And the, the word Lord, if there is a translation to it, it's kind of like I am who I am. In other words, he's, he's the all-existent one. He's, 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 he is. He exists. So here is the word of the Lord coming to, Je to, to uh, Jonah. Who's Jonah? Well, he's an Israelite prophet, right? Okay. Now, when you go and you take a look at what happens to the Ninevites, you don't see Lord. What do you see? You see God. Now, are these two different gods? No. Because Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord, He is the true and the living God. Right? But He's not Lord because He's not the Ninevites. Um, he doesn't have a covenant with them like Israel did. And so going back to, Sharon, I think you, you mentioned this about, you know, here are these people that worship all kinds of different gods, you know, that they were turned to um, you know, the true and the living God. Well, for, for people who are polytheistic, that is, that they worship a bunch of gods, it, it's not a whole lot of trouble for them to go and add something else to it. Especially if you're thinking, okay, you know, we've made this God angry, so we need to do this. I think this is a little bit more than that, though. You know, I think that they understood this is the true and the living God that is, you know, the supreme. Okay. But I, I kind of found that to be a little bit interesting as I was going through here and kind of taking a look at things. All right. Okay. Now, real quick. Um, Jonah. The word Jonah. When you take a look at the name Jonah, you got him, obviously, in the book of Jonah, right? You've also got him back in 2 Kings that we took a look at. Um, but you also have Jonah mentioned four times in, or excuse me, three times in the New Testament. Okay? You got him in Matthew chapter 11. You got him in Luke chapter 12. Excuse me, Matthew chapter 12, Luke chapter 11. And then also in um, Matthew chapter 16. Now, Matthew chapter 12, Luke chapter 11 uh, are, whether it's the same event and whether it's the same people or not, it's the same subject matter. And that is that the Jews were coming to Jesus and trying to get him to prove that he was the Messiah by showing a sign. And he said, no sign's going to be go given to you except for the sign of Jonah. And then later on in Luke chapter, or Mar um, Matthew <laughs> chapter 16, he's saying, it's the same thing. No sign's going to be given to you except for the sign of Jonah. Okay, so let's turn over to um, Matthew chapter 12 and let's take a look at this and kind of see a little bit more about um, Jesus and what he said and, and kind of compare more back here to the people of Nineveh. Okay, so in Matthew chapter 12 and in verse number 38, it says, Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. Now, who did they think they were that they could go up to Jesus and say, You show us a miracle. You've got to prove who you are and we demand it right here and now. You show us a miraculous sign. Right now, do you do you have see a problem with that? Do you, do you see a problem with um, you know they're really not asking that question, wanting to believe, are they? They're really asking that question, making that demand in a state of unbelief, and they're probably hoping that whatever Jesus does or whatever Jesus says, they can then go on and use it against him, right? You know, if he says, no, I'm not going to do what you want me to do, then they can go away and say, see, he can't do it, you know. Or if he goes and he performs some kind of miracle, then maybe they could say, well, you know, he didn't do this or, well, he, he really didn't do it. It was really just, okay. So what Jesus answered to them was this, a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a miraculous sign, but none will be given uh, it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. Okay? Now, looking at, hold your place there in Matthew chapter um, 12 and go on over to Luke chapter 11. And let's kind of see, like I said, this, this may be the same story and same event, or there may have been um, a similar situation, but different people and um, a different time period. 
But in Luke chapter 11, in verse 29, it says, As the crowds increase, Jesus said, This is a wicked generation. It asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Now, look at the next verse. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. Okay, so how was Jonah assigned to the Ninevites? Well, look at the miraculous things that God did for Jonah to get to Nineveh, right? And then when Jonah was there, what did he preach? Well, he didn't say repent, but <laughs> that's what happened. That was the end result, was the repentance, right? You know, God's destruction is coming. Okay, so they figured it out. Hey, we need to repent. Okay. So, you know, here is Jonah being the sign of the Ninevites. Now, here's Jesus, but Jesus is the same similar thing, isn't he? And that is that Jesus is sent to the world, and really, there is the idea of repentance. As a matter of fact, Jesus' message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's at nearby. You need to repent in order to get and escape God's judgment and get over into the kingdom of heaven. Okay? And so here's this type of thing. Now, let's go back to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 12. Okay, so after he says that nobody, nothing's going to be given except for the sign of the prophet Jonah, he goes on to make a comparison. He says, for as Jonah was in um, the uh, three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so here is another little comparison between Jesus and Jonah. And that is Jonah, in order to show, you know, that of who he really was, that God was sending him, he, he had this event happen to him. Of course, it didn't have to happen to him. It did because of his stubbornness. But here we have Jesus, and Jesus, as far as the proof of who he was, he did all of the miracles to prove that he really was the Messiah, but what was it that really showed that he was indeed the Messiah beyond a shadow of a doubt? He was dead for three days and three nights in the tomb, and then he arose from the dead. Okay? And so here you have this. Now, look at this last little part here. In verse number 41, it says, The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah was here. So you, just imagine this. You've got the people of Nineveh being in sin, and God is sending Jonah to them to get them to repent of their sin. You've got the people of Jesus' day, and by large, all of humanity. But the people of Jesus' day... And God has sent Jesus to not only preach to them, but to be a sacrifice for their sins, but to preach to them. Um, and uh, you got Jesus, who's greater than Jonah. The people of Nineveh believed at the preaching of Jonah. The people of Jesus' day, some believe, but you know, the ones that he is talking to here, were not believers in that. And so you can see, at the last day, the, the people of Nineveh, are going to stand up, and the very thing of what they did is going to condemn the very actions of what these people didn't do. And so today, you know, is Jonah more than a fish story? Well, absolutely. <laughs> because, you know, Paul, you're right. It is, a, you know, one lesson to learn is what happens if we don't obey God. But uh, another lesson to be learned is, you know, what, um, what the preaching of God is to a lost and a dying world and how people should respond to that. Okay. All right. You got any questions or comments about all that? Okay. You talk about that from uh, chapter 2 to chapter 3, that Jonah went back home, but I didn't see that in there. Okay, I'll, I'll clarify. It, it's not that he went back home, but he didn't go to Nineveh. Okay, there, there was a period of time, because it's not as if Jonah got off the boat and said, Okay, Lord, I'm going to Nineveh, and he went. You know, he got off the boat, and he didn't go. 
And then the word of the Lord came to him a second time. So whether that was a week, whether that was a month, whether that was a year, you know, who knows. But the point is that he didn't immediately go to Nineveh. Instead, he stopped and he waited. Okay, And maybe he was thinking, like what we talked about before, maybe he was thinking somebody else, God's going to send somebody else. I've messed up my chance, you know, what it, whatever it was. But, um, you know, he, he, he didn't go. And so because he didn't go, that was not what he vowed in the fish. Because if he vowed in the fish, I'm going to Nineveh, he would have gone immediately to Nineveh and not waited for God. Does that make sense? Yeah. I guess I guess what I'm wondering is it says that you know that you know, he found him up on the land. Mm-hmm. Is it possible that God spoke to him then and gave him the word again and he got up from there and then went to Nineveh? Well, it is, other than um, just the you know, kind of the the language that's there. Um, there's a little bit of a, a finality. Um, when we go to chapter two. You know, where it says, and the Lord commanded the fish and he vomited Jonah on the, the land. Okay. And so it's kind of like that, that closes that out. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. I mean, it could be that, you know, like what you were saying, uh, Carol, is that, you know, it maybe it even happened that day. Um, but the idea is that, you know, because Jonah didn't get up and say, okay, I'm going to Nineveh, you know, if he, was, if he came out of the fish with the intent of, I'm going to Nineveh to preach the word of the Lord, why would the word of the Lord have to come to him a second time? The, the prompting of the Lord, Lord's word coming a second time was what he, got him going in that direction. Okay? Good question. All right. Uh, anybody else? 